working bilingual students uh, through our equity town hall event that we had oh, a month and a half ago, parents gave us some a real quality feedback that they were thrust into the role of being quasi teachers uh, since March. And so uh, we really needed to support them in knowing how to navigate uh, some of our online tools and being able to access those resources. And so uh, Parent uh, University has been uh, put together in response to that. And uh, lastly, but how are we keeping SEL uh, at the center? And, and, and though we may be learning uh, through a distance, we need to make sure we're uh, meeting the social emotional needs of students. So that is a brief example of the uh, equity lens that we're putting in place and applying each and every day through each department uh, within Kansas City Public Schools. Next, I want to uh, take you through our equity planning uh, process and want to remind everyone that uh, this district went through a strategic planning process several years ago um, <clears throat> under the uh, leadership of Dr. Bedell. And within that strategic plan, it outlined three areas where equity needed to uh, carry out. So we're going to uh, touch on those this evening. Uh, uh, key action 7.5, just making sure we had an onboarding process uh, for equity. We're going to talk to that. 10.1, uh, ensuring that each school and department aligned uh, its own plans to the district-wide equity plan, which we'll discuss a little bit later. And then lastly, 11.2 uh, calls on us to create uh, in an innovative way, new data collection and reporting systems that would increase the effective use of data so that principals and other leaders can make uh, informed leadership decisions. So we're gonna to touch on each of those now, starting with Key Action 7.5. So with the formal onboarding process, partnered with the Human Resources Department, they already had a process in place for, uh, uh, that they call Focus Thursday Fridays. And uh, each month, principals and directors come in for important trainings uh, and professional development needed for, the, for their leadership within the uh, school system. So I was able to partner with them this past year to uh, introduce equity to principals and directors. Uh, we've continued that for this upcoming year. And there are four trainings scheduled for principals and directors uh, for the schools or departments they lead. Um, the first bullet that I want to bring to your attention is the implicit bias training. Last year, we trained over 600 employees, and already this summer, we've trained uh, 400 employees. And so we uh, anticipate that there will be additional employees that sign up for that training, a lot of positive uh, feedback with that. And so uh, you see the other trainings listed that our employees will have access to. And really I want to call your attention to that middle bullet. Uh, that one specifically is for the uh, board. Uh, you know, I know we're going to get together on the leading and governing for equity, but the others are available to our employees. As we move to key action 10.1, this asks that the schools will align their plan to the upcoming equity plan. And at the last update, I shared that we have four draft key areas. We've sifted through an awful lot of data as it relates to our school system. And we say these are draft areas because when we enter into the engagement process, we really want the uh, stakeholders, our administrators, teachers, and others who sign up for these various committees to endorse that these are four areas that we should be focused on. Uh, but in, in, until we get to that part of the process, uh, these are the four areas that we're looking at. Number one, recruitment, retention of teachers of color. Two, reducing discipline uh, disparities. Three, reducing disparities in reading proficiency in the early years. And then four, ensuring equitable access to our signature schools. And I should highlight that uh, it does state that our original plan was to, after winter break, was to uh, begin engaging stakeholders uh, through a process and uh, due to the abrupt shift that we had to make <clears throat> during spring break to uh, online learning, uh, the equity steering committee that drives this work, we're, we all have our respective departments that we lead. <clears throat> and so uh, we did lose a few months because everyone was really busy uh, 
you know, tr trying to uh, shift to that uh, digital learning. And so uh, we are now back on track with our meetings, uh, but because of that three months of uh, responding to uh, COVID-19, uh, we may be uh, just a little off track from our original target completion date of September 2021, <clears throat> but we shouldn't be too far off from that in order to bring that final document to the board for adoption, review, approval, and adoption. So moving to that first priority, recruitment, retention of teachers of color. This really, you know, you've heard this before from Dr. Collier in the HR updates. Uh, there's ample research that indicates that all students would benefit from having at least one teacher of color, you know, especially in that elementary uh, level. And we're unable to achieve that at this uh, present uh, time. And though we serve 90% children of color, uh, we are about 36% teachers of color. I'll state that again. 90, we serve 90% students of color and our teaching force is around 36%. Uh, teachers of color. And so we believe there are opportunities to really look at strategies to not only recruit more or grow our own, uh, uh, but then also how do we support those teachers to retain them once they're uh, uh, within our ranks. And so that is something that is uh, being focused on as priority number one. Number two is reducing discipline disparities. So as we look at our data, and again, we poured over a lot of data uh, above and beyond these four areas. We looked at, you know, 9, 10, 11 areas, but these are our four that we focused in on. So uh, what you're looking at is suspension data from SY17 to 19. And if you look at SY19, for example, what it's showing is that for every 100 black students in our school system, 20 of them received a suspension. So stated another way, one in five students who are black in Kansas City Public Schools has received a suspension in SY19. And you compare that to <clears throat> about uh, eight per 100 for Hispanic and about 10 for white students, 10 out of, for every 100. Uh, that is a, a disparity that we believe we have opportunity to uh, uncover what's driving that within our schools. Uh, when we look at 2019-20, uh, we do see that we have more suspensions for black students. I do want to point out that uh, they hold black students are the majority uh, of students we serve. And so, uh, but what I really wanted to point out from this screen is that if you look at the red bar, which are female students, want to bring to light that even though we focus a lot on the disparity between male students, our female students are uh, also show a disparity. And so we don't want that to be missed within uh, this conversation and within our planning process. So when we say reducing discipline disparity, it's wherever it rears its head uh, per the data. And so in summary, what we find from our data is that black male students make up 49% of the suspension offenses, though are only 28% of the district population. You compare that with white male students, 4% of OSS days, but 5% of district population. So right in line with enrollment, Hispanic male students, 9% uh, of OSS offenses, and 15% uh, of the district population. So you see that um, that disparity is there for black males. And so black male students, per the data, are twice as likely as white male students uh, to be suspended, uh, to receive OSS. Okay, next, wanting to uh, increase reading proficiency in grades K through two or reduce the disparities uh, that we see. And so uh, you can't see uh, this clearly, but what you're looking at is iReady data. This top chart shows uh, those students who are above level. Uh, the bottom one on this slide are students below, I'm sorry, on level. This next slide, you'll see students who are one level below, and then that bottom graph are two or more levels below. <clears throat> and so when we summarize that data, what we found is that of 
all of the K through two students who took the iReady test, 15% of black students, 16% of Hispanic students were two or more levels below. Compare, uh, compare that with 8% of white students were two or more levels below. And so what we believe is that there are opportunities that uh, we know that in third grade, students will take the MAP test for the first time and we'll get a chance to see the, uh, their performance level on the state exam. Uh, but if we have students you know, from K, first and second grade, we believe that we can put more uh, emphasis into closing those gaps at a more rapid pace uh, and through this equity planning process to really uh, deepen the level of strategies and, and bring more people to the table in order to to arrive at those high outcomes that we want for all students. Okay, moving on to ensuring equitable access to signature schools. In recent years, the Kansas City Star brought to the community's attention that Lincoln Prep's black student population uh, had fallen for a 10th consecutive year. Um, we are fully aware of the history of magnet schools, not only in Kansas City, but across the country, that the, the uh, original intent of magnet schools was to draw students you know, from their neighborhoods that are oftentimes uh, socially, uh, economically, racially uh, segregated into, into schools that, that provided a curricula and specialized programs that they couldn't get in their neighborhood schools. And so uh, bringing uh, this diverse group of students to centralized uh, schools was to enhance the learning and the uh, diversity of those schools. And so as we see around the country is that uh, magnet schools, or in our case, we've renamed our signature schools are becoming less diverse and they're becoming really places of segregation. And so uh, once that article release, we wanted to look at our data to see, you know, what's going on with the trend. And what we found is that what you're looking at is we pulled the data for all students with qualifying scores for LCPA. And 30, only 39% of black students with qualifying scores actually ended up at Lincoln Prep. Compare that to 43% of white students that have qualifying scores ended up going on to uh, Lincoln Prep. And you compare that to 52% of Latino students, Latinx students with qualifying scores going to Lincoln Prep. And so uh, if you look at the other categories, uh, we also have students uh, emerging bilinguals that had qualifying scores as well as students with IEPs, but only 12% of uh, English language learners, only 28% of students with IEPs actually ended up at Lincoln Prep. And so the qualifications and the qualifiers are in place. We believe there's opportunity to explore and lift over the, up, you know, the cover to see, are we unintentionally putting up barriers to uh, some families being able to access uh, that, that school and that program? Uh, what we learned through, uh, you know, uh, the coronavirus pandemic is that, you know, many families brought it to our attention that they did not have uh, Wi-Fi or, or access to the internet. And so I could imagine, and we could all imagine that uh, many teachers have, you know, in the past been giving assessments to students, you know, thinking that they, you know, access the resources at home and were studying. And when they come back, uh, may have had a, a low score. And we thought we were assessing what students know, we really were assessing what they don't have. And so if they didn't have access to the internet for the resources for learning, uh, you know, going to online applications for signature schools or for enrollment, you know, did it put up a barrier? I, you know, I'm not saying that's the case, but through this process, we're going to look at all of the ways that families can access, not just Lincoln, but all of our signature schools. We have eight in the district and we want to ensure through our processes as we continue to flush this out that we are ensuring equitable access for all. And so as we recall our definition of equity, access, representation, meaningful particip participation and high outcomes for each and every uh, student and family that we serve, 
uh, this is our charge through the board policy 0, 0.0. And uh, again, this is above and beyond these four priorities that we're focused on, focusing in on for this plan. Uh, this work is at play uh, each and every day in Kansas City Public Schools. The last key action that we want to uh, focus on per the strategic plan is 11.2 that asks for innovative ways for us to uh, break down the data so that principals and directors can really drive those important leadership decisions, particularly as it relates to opportunity uh, access and equity. And so one of the uh, ideas that we have for producing that uh, in is the equity audit. So we introduced this idea last school year. However, we uh, were uh, trying to find an equity data analyst. We now have one. Uh, has been hired maybe as of three weeks ago within the equity inclusion and innovation uh, office. And so what you see is a sample audit, uh, a full audit will be able to send you maybe in a Friday update. So you can see several examples from several different schools. <clears throat> so it would contain too much data to put on one slide. So this is just a snippet of what would be uh, included within that audit. And this is an actual audit from one of our elementary schools. And so just want to bring your attention to just a few uh, items and you'll be able to see how this tool will be useful for our leaders in making uh, informed decisions moving forward. So if we look at the student demographics up top, and I just want to draw your attention to the far right column of demographics, you see at this particular school, 10.3% of the school uh, are Asian students. And if you follow that same column down to the bottom where we are tracking OSS days <clears throat> or percent of uh, suspensions within those demographic groups, you'll see that uh, the 10.3 percent of the school Asian students accounted for zero percent of suspension days within this elementary school. And if we go over to the middle of that student demographics column underneath Hispanic column, which make up 35.2% of the school, if we go down to the uh, bottom, uh, Hispanic students within this elementary make up 10.4% of suspension days. So if uh, Asian students at 0%, though they're 10% of the population, Hispanic students 10.4, though they're 35% of the school population, if there's underrepresentation there, we know that somewhere uh, there's some uh, group that's overrepresented. And if we go to the uh, black column over second from the left, within this elementary school, 41.4% of students are uh, black within the school and uh, account for 74% of suspensions. Uh, lastly, we want to bring to your attention that through the audit, we also not only will break it down by ethnicity, but also by gender. And also we will break it down uh, through specialized programs, students with IEPs, et cetera. And again, you'll, you'll get a copy of an actual audit so you can see how detailed it is. But in this case, if you look at under student demographics, we've highlighted the line for female students. And within the school, 200 students out of the 418 are female. Of the 200 female students, 81 of them are black. 81, you know, that's about 40% of the girls in the school are, are black, but if we go down to the bottom of, of that column, the 40% of the school are, that are girls make up 88.5% of the suspension days for girls within this elementary school. And you compare that to 0% of Hispanic girls, 0% of Asian girls, we do see 11.5% of white girls, uh, but that is, that is a huge disparity that the principal of this elementary school, when he or she receives this audit, you know, has to question, are black girls within this elementary school truly behaving differently than other girls of similar age, or is there bias at play within the school? So being able to look at data in this way, not just the outcome data, but then to also see the intersection of how it impacts every other area within the school. So when we begin to look at academic performance, uh, you and I, uh, we will perform better on a test if we were present to receive the instruction. And so 
we can begin to make uh, correlations between academic performance and those who have been you know, asked not to be at school for periods of time through OSS. And so uh, through the equity audit process, again, we believe leaders will uh, be able to make uh, decisions, leadership decisions for their school. And we believe that this will allow us to uh, make good on 11.2. So what's next? Uh, we <clears throat> will develop, I'm sorry, we will uh, look at KPIs, uh, existing work policies, and want to introduce uh, the equity context analysis process. Hey, Daryl, let everybody know you got an audience. What's KPIs? I know you introduce it here. I think you spell it on the next slide, but let thank you, Doctor. That is immediately. Thank you, Doctor. Bedell. Sure. should have uh, spelled it out. Key performance <laughs> indicators. So, uh, key performance indicators are the indicators that let us know if we're moving toward our desired result. And so uh, through, the, through the process, the uh, equity planning process, the, those who sign up to serve on those four committee areas, whether it's your interest area is equitable access to uh, signature schools or reducing uh, discipline disparities, or if, you're, if literacy is your interest, or if you're on the committee for, uh, to help us think through how we can recruit and retain uh, teachers of color, uh, through that process, we will develop our KPIs that will determine where we want to be in three years, in five years, and what are those uh, indicators that will let us know that we're incrementally on track to, to achieve that target. That will come out uh, through this process and will be included in the plan. So as we think through uh, our existing board policies and uh, really, every single board policy can be revised uh, and rewritten through an equity lens. Uh, most of the policies were adopted in 2013. And, you know, I recall when these were adopted, and I believe that they were an improvement over the policies we had uh, previously. But as we, you know, begin to close out 2020, you know, are these policies really where we are currently today? And are these policies written in a way that would take us uh, into the future with where we are with diversity, uh, equity, and inclusion. And I uh, you know, do want to point out that the district's mission and vision even that still appear on our website are from a strategic plan that we, that we uh, put together in 2010. And so uh, within that vision and mission statement, the words diversity, equity, inclusion are nowhere mentioned in those statements and it truly does not reflect where we are as an organization today. And so I want to set that as context for our board policies as well. So just gonna look at a couple and uh, I do wanna say, I've, you know, looked at uh, all of them, they all could be revised, um, you know, so but these are just an, ex uh, an example. So if we look at the, uh, the first priority within the equity planning uh, process is being able to recruit and retain teachers of color. And so when we look at board policy 4.9 and the policy name is personnel standards, it gives a, a long list. This is just half of the, uh, the, uh, the list. There are others that, that state who the superintendent shall or shall not employ. And there's all these qualifiers for who should be employed within the school system. Nowhere within uh, this policy is it stated that we as an organization serve a very diverse community and that we value the diversity, uh, not only amongst our students, but uh, as it relates to this policy amongst our staff, you know, amongst our teachers, our administrators and all staff, it's not listed anywhere in policy uh, of that stance. So we believe there's opportunity to bring uh, personnel standards into where we are in 2020. Uh, as we look at our priority around wanting to reduce those literacy or, or reading proficiency uh, disparities at the early grades, you know, I did find in policy, it does state that we have this vision and I'll, I'll just go ahead and read it out that all scholars will demonstrate literacy, numeracy and critical thinking skills at or above grade level both as a whole and by groups. Scholars demonstrating below grade level performance will demonstrate significant growth each school year. I think it's you know strong, but I believe there's could be opportunities to emphatically state 
you know, not just by groups where we assume, you know, what that means, but to state, you know, who those groups are and, 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 that, and that especially for groups who have been historically marginalized, that we will apply any and all resources necessary to address the gaps and needs of students who may be furthest from educational justice. There are opportunities uh, to, to guide that language in a way that, you know, uh, above and beyond, you know, uh, be, all of us that are on this call that, you know, those in 10 years will still be through equity, will spend additional resources where necessary so that all students can achieve high outcomes uh, per the policy as it's written, uh, we may be able to strengthen uh, that language for the future. And so then also we want to talk about the ECAP. And the ECAP is uh, more than just a survey, it's more than just an audit, it really is a comprehensive data collection process that we will undergo. Uh, this will allow us to identify you know, areas within our school system, opportunities for growth as it relates to advancing educational equity. Again, it's not an audit, it's really a true engagement of multiple stakeholders and it will allow us to leverage their input in our equity planning process. So who takes this survey? Uh, we're gonna start with three stakeholder categories, administrators, parents, uh, or caregivers, and staff. And <clears throat> uh, we will have a later round, uh, a, a post, you know, a second round where we will engage students and there will be a third round, which will uh, even include some uh, small group and uh, observations. But this is the process we'll start with. And because we have recently surveyed and engaged our parents, you know, especially as it relates to opening of school, uh, we didn't believe that right now is the right time to send out another survey. Uh, but within you know a couple of months, we definitely before middle November. Uh, late November want to have this particular process completed so that when we engage our committee work after winter break, we have this data also to inform our final decisions as we move forward. And so the outcomes of the ECAP, uh, you see the seven domains that uh, this will look at. And, you know, I really like it because it not only will let us know as parents share about their experience or in staff help us identify areas where we are not as equitable as we would like to be. Uh, but we'll also per that data be able to see uh, the intersection of different identities within groups. So for example, uh, we could uh, see maybe what a, an experience of say a, uh, a, Lat a Latinx student is, uh, a Latinx students at the elementary level, Latinx students, at the elementary level with uh, a parent whose native language is not English, uh, who ha has an IEP, like we can do this across multiple groups who have uh, different identities to, uh, to really narrow down and target who's not benefiting from the way things currently are and where are their opportunities to be more equitable uh, within Kansas City Public Schools. <clears throat> Uh, and as you see that last bullet, uh, really to create uh, system-wide change for uh, students, all students, especially those who have been historically marginalized. All right, and uh, so that is our equity update. Uh, you kind of heard the timeline and what we hope to be able to produce and bring to you after we have engaged, uh, going through a full engagement process. Uh, this equity plan will, will guide our, our, at least those four priorities uh, for the next few few years, and uh, I open it up for questions at this time. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Dr. Bedell, is there anything you wanted to say before we start with questions? Yeah, I mean, it's it's um, the data is real, and it tells us a lot about our practices as a school system and the things that we seriously have to address and you know it's um <clears throat> just that's one school and and I, one of the things I said to Dr. Davis when we were going through this and we you know this is our third time hearing this presentation was you know well the, the good news is in the aggregate we are reducing suspension rates in this school district the bad news is 
the disparities don't, we're not working on that. So while we're in the aggregate lowering things, we still see the, the significant disparities around who still continues to get suspended. And I know that there's been a lot of talk. I've more squared and folks have come in and said, you know, district, we really need to see some level of commitment from you all with the suspension rates, with the elementary kids. And, you know, I think um, this, this is the reason why we're doing this. This data is telling of our practices in this school system right now and how we see certain kids based on how they show up. And, 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 and the truth is, if a lot of the suspensions are due to level one, level two infractions, rather than it being level three or level four, like these are things then where we do have a lot of subjectivity. And as a building principal, I want our principals to have autonomy. They gotta be able to run their campuses, but we also have to be able to provide them with rich data like this, school by school, that tells you that do you want this label attached to you as a leader? What practices need to take place and need to change on your campuses in order to get this reduced. And, and it, it, that's, that's a real campus there that you guys saw. We have work to do and it's not acceptable. And so we wanna make sure that people aren't just, these things aren't just happening and people aren't aware of it, then it's too late when you get a report like, you're like, wow, I did not even realize this was going on. I mean, that's, that's the editorial that I did a couple of weeks ago. How I said, I'm gonna throw my power at this kid that was sagging on my floor, cause I don't play that. And guess what, man, you out of here. That's very subjective, but we have power to do that. And that's the piece that we have to let this data help guide us through around the work that we need to do to, to eliminate these inequities. And I love what Daryl said, educational justice. These kids have been robbed. I've been saying this for all four years and we've been making progress. I'm very proud, I'll be very proud to announce to you some good data when we give you all the update on the data points that we've gotten back that we've been able to get. We have done some work in this district, but it's not fast enough and it's not enough. And uh, if I could add Dr. Bedell uh, uh, to the board, we have made a lot of progress progress over the last few years, especially as it relates to graduation rates. You've seen that rate steadily climb each year. Uh, you've also seen uh, some of the systems that have been put in place, whether it's the graduation PLC, whether it's uh, the uh, grad labs uh, that help toward that end. Uh, also the partnership that we have with the uh, middle college uh, program. We, we have made progress there. We've made progress as it relates to uh, advanced you know, programming. We set a goal for advanced placement, for example, uh, to double the number of students who scored a three or above in uh, AP uh, tests, but we not only doubled or uh, hit the 100% increase, uh, we multiplied that by five, 500% increase in the uh, scores that came back this past year. We're making progress in quite a few areas of the, uh, uh, Unfortunately, uh, those areas where we're making progress are not the areas that we will focus on in an equity plan. And so uh, this, this presentation was around disparities that we can need to continue to flush out and, um, and find solutions for. So I, I, I'm glad Dr. Bedell mentioned, there are a lot of other areas where we've made significant progress that was not a part of this presentation. Um, so thank you, Dr. Bedell for, for mentioning that. Thank you, Dr. Riddell. I, I know I have uh, multiple questions, but I'm gonna open it to my colleagues. I think Mr. Barca, you wanted to start? Sure, uh, let me start with a very specific one that I have two others uh, that are kind of broad. When it comes to that sample audit, um, do you account for individuals who may have been uh, repeat offenders in some of these? So for example, if you have one individual who has committed multiple offenses and been suspended several times, does that person populate then as three different impacts to those scores or is that kind of filtered out into your data? Uh, in that particular report, it would have accounted. So it is possible that one student who had three suspensions would have been counted three times uh, within that, that particular uh, data. We do have a, a way to 
uh, <clears throat> to run an unduplicated report when we're looking at numbers, uh, but because that report was actually looking at percent of suspension days, uh, we didn't run it that way. But yeah, we I was just trying to make sure and, and understand if, if there are individuals there who could, could have been counted multiple times, which is going to skew some of that. So just wanted to put that out there. The other question, I guess, is more broadly about um, how we can support um, and, and understand a little bit more. Did I understand correctly, what is the size of the team that you currently operate that focuses solely on this, right? Because I know you encompass a lot of different issue areas that are very important and all draw from very different aspects of, of the solutions side of this. But what is the size of your team? So the, uh, <clears throat> so I do have a, a department, you know, uh, that includes, you know, several different uh, divisions, uh, but that is not necessarily included in what was shown tonight. This is really the work of the Equity Steering Committee, which is, uh, which encompasses multiple uh, departments. So, so I, I lead the committee, but we have uh, HR uh, represented, uh, Dr. Carter is on there. We have exceptional education. Um, we have communications. We have, uh, uh, we've added assessment. Uh, actually, Dr. Letitia Woodley is joining the team. We have multiple diverse perspectives. We have uh, Ms. Lisa Gooden, who is a parent uh, on the committee. We have a principal on the team, uh, Ms. Leah Starr. Uh, so it's a very diverse committee of various stakeholders that have helped to sift through uh, this data and to help focus in these uh, four areas. And we'll also be a part of uh, helping to lead the engagement work. So we'll split up and uh, lead various you know, discussion groups um, as we continue to get more input from our, our additional stakeholders who have not been a part of the initial uh, process. Thank you for that. I, I just, I guess my last statement is, um, I love all this, right? I mean, uh, your presentations are, are some that I have thousands of questions for and I wanna keep it limited for my colleagues sake. Um, but I think the general sentiment from everyone, right? Is our superintendent saying he's supportive of these efforts. You have board members who are gonna weigh in saying that we're very supportive of these efforts. And I guess the part that I'm missing are the solutions that I personally can vote on that will allow us to move this forward in a fast enough time frame, right? Not, not to rush it, right? I love the data-driven side of this, but mm -hmm. I feel like I was here last year when we had the equity conversation and it was the same type of thing as we're still gathering data, we're still looking for solutions. And I just, and we all know somewhat of the problem. So how, how do we transition to get past some of that and get to the real work of, you know, the bold action of the bold proposals, um, kind of like what Joe and his team did is, you know, hey, let's, let's buy a laptop for every student and provide them with Wi-Fi. Um, something as, as audacious as that to really bridge this gap that we have and cause dramatic change in these numbers. Because I just, I'm worried about each class that we pass and each year that we talk about this discussion, we're, we're missing one group of students completely. And they're going into the next one uh, next grade with with this on their their um, their shoulders, and so I, I really want to see that opportunity for me as a board member to move something forward. Is all I'm going to say. Yes, and thank you for that. And and so I do want to be clear that uh, though this is a uh, tool and a process uh, that is coming out, uh, this work does continue each and every day. And you know, I was a principal for 12 years. This is a part of the daily work. You know, reducing. Uh, suspensions, increasing attendance, increasing parental engagement, all of that is a part of the daily work and planning that occurs uh, every day. So uh, no one's necessarily waiting on this process to catch up. This work, you know, these decisions are, are part of, you know, that, that, that school level uh, work. But what, uh, what we believe that through this process that this work is uh, so significant that it should engage multiple stakeholders uh, somewhat in the same way that a strategic plan touch uh, multiple stakeholders. And so we could, with the administrators and leaders and parents that have served on the committee to get us this far, uh, we could really flush out the strategies that we believe will get us there. And so whenever you have a gap or disparity uh, such as this, uh, we could, you know, go on our own hypothesis as to the why. We know there's a lot of systemic, you know, barriers that students face before they even arrive. Uh, we believe we are addressing much of the bias and the implicit bias that now, you know, a thousand employees uh, have gone through. We, we still haven't hit, you know, another 800 to another thousand, but we believe that we are making incremental steps toward 
uh, pr making preparations, ground preparation, foundational preparations to really get to the real root of this. And I do want to say that I believe that once this is all flushed out, we're likely going to have to apply more resources in areas and ways that we have not in the past. So as we look at the need and the importance of, say, restorative practices as it relates to uh, reducing uh, suspension as being a default response to student infraction, have we fully invested in training all teachers in how to be more culturally responsive and how to be uh, how to uh, be restorative within that classroom, there may be, you know, uh, additional investment that we have to make. That's just one. Uh, you know, we may find that in order to truly do whatever is necessary to, to bring every student up to reading proficiency within the two years to three years we have before they take the math test in third grade, it may require a significant amount of resource that we have not you know, looked at in the past. We really wanted to be a full committee that's helping to say, this is what it's going to take to truly achieve equity, you know, per board policy 0, 0.0, to give each and every student the additional support that he or she needs to be successful is what the policy uh, in, uh, pulls out. And so, so we do, uh, to, I guess to, in short, we do have our own strategies that we believe will take us there. We've listed them out, but we don't want to go to the committees and say, yeah, we've already worked it out. You know, you just tell us with this work, we really want to uh, be equitable in our process of getting to a document that every stakeholder can buy in on. And so it may take us just a little bit longer, but in the meantime, every school should still be working toward reducing those disparities when they get their equity audits within uh, this next month. Let me, let me, and let me just add on to that response, because to me, it's, it's simple. You said, well, I have a vote. Well, part of that vote is to, if we really want to start doing stuff, we talked about policy. We talked about spending some time on unpacking some of these policies, getting the language in there, getting the right, um, you know, adjectives and verbs with everything that we need to do to truly say that these policies are aligned to what we want to see happen is 0, 0.0. What gets done in policy tends to be what actually gets done in actuality. So that is the phase, that's the piece. And then there's a lot of other things that I think you guys, I'm certain I'll hear from a multiple board members that I think are gonna be some phenomenal ideals on things that we can do in the immediate, but that policy piece is going to be critical because that's what gets monitored. Having the KPIs aligned to what the policy is saying needs to happen, that's when things get done. That's why these board monitoring workshops work that's why we've been getting the results because the things where we do have kpis for it's easy for you all to follow to say are you guys doing what you said we're going to do it generally when we've done these kpis in the past my understanding is that that was like a workshop that the board was engaged in with administration to come up with some of those kpis for some of the board monitoring uh uh to the board monitoring workshops that we have now so yeah, Mr. Barker, there's definitely some things we can do that are low hanging. We just gotta say, okay, it's time to do it. Um, I'm going to go ahead and turn it to Mr. Hogan and then Ms. Wolfsey raised her hand. I believe I may have seen Ms. Cortez, yes. Yeah, um, so. <laughs> One, I, I would echo Mr. Barker's sense of urgency and I get the reason for it, right? I mean. Um, but I also want to talk about, so I have a couple of comments and then a couple of questions, and I'll be, I'll be as, as brief as possible, uh, Madam Chair. Um, Dr. Davis, so I also remember last year's, our first sort of equity presentation, and the one thing that stood out then versus now is I feel like, and you're, you're super passionate, right? You, I mean, you, you can tell that this is where your heart is, and I so appreciate that because our kids benefit from it, but, and Dr. Bell smiled because I, I, I bet he knows where I'm going with this. But tonight's presentation, I think, was far above and beyond last year's because you were you were really succinct. You were on it. You gave us information that we needed. And and look, I, I think sometimes we tend to beat people up through Dr. Bedell and I try to be even handed. And I want to <laughs> praise you for delivering delivering a presentation that was really, really well thought out and presented and, and useful for this conversation. So thank you. Thank you. Um, 
I also want to applaud the school district for reducing the overall number of suspensions because I think that's that was a good place to start. Uh, but now we need to level up, right? We've got to go level up. Um, and so, Dr. Bedell, you mentioned more square, and there's other advocacy groups that have been pushing us to think about K through three um, suspensions. Um, and I don't mean the advocacy groups that groups that are you know dropping an email and then bailing on us. I'm talking about people who genuinely care about this city and these kids. Um, and I would, I think if we you know, one of your early slides around the equity policy said, you know, foster a barrier-free learning environment, right? And there is no greater barrier to learning than not being in school. And if we're facilitating our kids not being in school, we are creating barriers for them. And so thinking about it through that lens, I'd like to see the district be a lot more bold than just K through three. I don't understand why we're suspending any kid at any grade if they're not hitting that highest level of infraction, right? What is the purpose of that if we know that we're taking those kids out of school and they're not able to actually progress as a result of that? So it, it's it's a comment slash question and maybe you, maybe you wanna answer it, maybe you have an answer for why we wouldn't just apply that sort of highest level of infraction and, and only suspend those kids regardless of what grade level they're in. I don't know, what, what do you think? I think it, it definitely requires that you have to have, some, we got to have conversation. You got to engage building leaders. You got to put the support systems in place because some of it is that there is a need for kids to get the social and emotional supports that tend to draw them to those disciplinary infractions. You don't want to be in a situation where you're being cussed out every other day and you have no, no flat out lines of, you know, how do you, how do you, help this kid to understand that that's not an appropriate thing to do with adults, right? And then so, and it's deeper than that because sometimes kids act out because I don't have any place to live. I hit rock bottom. I really don't care. But I think as a system, you got to have those, you got to have those structures in place because you don't want to be in a scenario where you're saying, hey, no suspensions at all across the board. And I agree with you. I think level one and level two things we really need to focus on and figure out how we can do that differently. When you get to level three, fighting and things like that, I don't. I think those are things you don't have a choice for, yep. to, you know, to take action on. But I do believe that it it would require. I don't mind going bold at all. I just want to make sure that when we do it, it's it's in conjunction with everybody understanding. Okay, so if we're not going to do this, what's in place to help support and revitalize our kids? And I think that's going to be a community effort. That can't just be on building principals and teachers. That's got to be, to me, if we really want to do this, we're going to have to have support from this community and supporting us. And I, and that means if we, rather than suspend, because the only things I would do is I would tell parents, I don't want to suspend your child. You come up here and you can go into my office and you can have a conversation with your child. We let them go back to class. You know, but there were, there were rules in place too. Parents ain't allowed to come up and, you know, discipline their kids and, there's a lot of things that we have to figure out systemically. How do we, how do we, I, I, I want to go bold, but I think there's a lot of conversation that needs to happen. You can't uh, just tear that bandaid. Go ahead, Daryl. Uh, so if I could uh, add that this process lends more focus on the system, fixing the system than it is about, you know, addressing you know, individual uh, kids or individual infractions. So truly the suspension is not the real issue. It's more of a symptom. You know, if you, if you if my nose is running, you can give me a, a, a Kleenex and it, it, it addresses for it, you know, uh, but it, you, I've only really addressed the issue. Maybe the, the root cause is I'm outside, it's 10 degrees outside. And I don't have on a hat or a coat. So they give me a hat and a coat, maybe my nose will stop running. What we're looking at through this process is not so much looking at the, the symptom. Does every class have a caring classroom community? You know, we want to get to root causes for why we have student disagreements that lead to fights within the classroom. You know, have we set up that caring classroom culture where this is a family when we come in before we jump into math, science, social studies, and language arts on Monday morning, do we pause and say, hey, how was your weekend? 
let's have a check in here. You know, the teachers who are who have been trained and, and understand how to navigate that aspect of uh, teaching have fewer discipline within the classroom, which then results in fewer people going to office, fewer suspension. So we want to get to root cause analysis through all of this so that we're addressing what can actually have a broader uh, impact. And so, uh, so with, with, with that uh, being said, as we go through this process, really looking at, you know, uh, not only additional training, uh, because we can, we can say we want A, B, C, D, um, but really it's just getting to that, that root cause in every, each of these four priorities. Yeah, and I, I think it's the right approach, Dr. Davis. I guess my, my counter to that would be that even if you go focus intently on that, there's still going to be those teachers, right, with those kids in their class who may not have the right decision. And so then your building leadership has to go say, well, hang on, you know, I, I get it. But unless this kid has met the sort of the, the benchmark, if you will, for that infraction level that requires us to then suspend them, right, I've got to go help coach you as a teacher to make sure, look, this is how you handle that the next time. Let's get that kid back in your classroom, et cetera. And I think it kind of goes to some of the core at Mr. Abarca's point around, you know, what can we do in the resources? I mean, you know, so, the VOCA, the, I, I think, I was going to say, I think it goes back to, you know, the, the diversity in staff. And so uh, if we look at, you know, the, the number of, I'll just state males, you know, I believe that within our school system, 4% of our teaching staff are African-American males, about 2% uh, Latino males. Is there opportunity to bring in more male staff members uh, in certain and, and be strategic and targeted in that? If we look at uh, the population over at Knotts Elementary, and many of you have probably visited there, you will go there and you'll see that it looked, you know, I, I haven't really looked at the stats, but just walking from classroom to classroom, it appears that 90% of the students there are boys. And so if these are boys who other schools have referred to the alternative program, but yet when you walk around Knotts, you can't tell that's an alternative school. Students are engaged, they're well behaved, but I also saw a noticeable difference. There are more males there per you know ratio than I see in any other elementary school in our in our uh, school system. So I'm not saying that males are the uh, are the uh, the solution, but what I do see is that if the students who were having difficulties and challenges at the other 23 elementary schools, you put all of those, uh, the students who are having the most challenges in one location, and all of a sudden they're well behaved, then maybe it's not the students. You know, maybe it's, uh, so, you know, they're not predisposed to behave differently that, that no one can get through to them. What is it that we have to do to provide the appropriate training so these students can be successful back in their neighborhood and schools? So this process is going to focus on what do we as the adults, the employees, the staff, the system need to change so that every student can thrive? And I'm just using that as an example. And but with any school, we can find that same, you know, uh, disparity between outcomes. The same students, some staff can get higher outcomes out of the same students. So, so we have enough evidence that it's not students, it's the system. And so this process will get to that root cause. So then when we flush it out, the schools can see oh, okay, yeah, we, we've got to think deeper in order to really truly impact change. And, and, and I'm sorry, I don't think it's a quick process because we want right. to bring a yeah. lot of people along. Yeah, I, yeah, I don't, look, I don't want to rush it, but you know, one of our roles is to, to make sure that we're providing the resources for the work to be done. And it kind of gets to the core of one of Mr. Abarca's questions around what can we do? Yeah, and yeah. I think we're providing resources, but if there's more resources that are needed, to me, this is priority number one, right? Yeah. Nothing else in this district works very well in terms, of, in terms of turning the corner, as well as having an equity policy that deals with the sort of challenges that, that our students um, face. What, one, I guess my other question slash comment, and then I'll move on, but I do, Madam Chair, I do want to make sure we spend a lot of time on this tonight. This is super, super important. Um, so you mentioned um, on the ECAP um, piece of this, 
um, you know, just the comprehensive data collection analysis process and all the stakeholders. The one thing I didn't see in terms of a stakeholder is students. And in reading, you know, Dr. Lavelle Brown's, you know, Culture of Love book, he puts a lot of emphasis on engaging with students and getting their feedback and making sure that they're part of these really, really important conversations. So I don't know if you plan to survey survey them. Obviously, the presentation would be different than the adults potentially, but um, hopefully they're baked into that process as well. Yes, they will not be a part of round one, but they will be a part of round two. And so we have traditionally at the end of each school year issued a student survey. And um, you know, I'll just be frank in that um, what we've done in the past really hasn't been that usable as it relates to you know, ensuring equity uh, because we have not asked students to uh, self-identify. And so, for example, if we have an elementary school where we ask a question, the question could be, you know, uh, is, is my culture valued, you know, in this school? You know, and I'm mean, just making up a question. It, you, can, you can ask 10 other questions, but if 80% of students said yes, then we could look at that survey and say, hey, 80% of students said, you know, um, they feel included within the school. We say that's high, we'll celebrate, we move on. But if we ask students to self-identify, you know, are, you know are, are they you know, male, female, uh, ethnicity, et cetera, then when we look at that data within that 80%, we might find that of the 30% of the school, that 20% all came from one group. And then we can say, oh, we have a problem here, folks. And we can respond to that data and that survey in a different way. So we want to uh, create a new and improved survey for students uh, in round two. And we will come back and engage students in that. And we already have that in the uh, in the stakeholder and the parent one. And we'll, we'll have to kind of revise our student survey, but it is on the uh, agenda to do that. Um, okay, so I wanna turn it to uh, Ms. Wolfsey and then to Ms. Cortez. Thank you, Dr. Davis. Um, I, I just want to echo what uh, my colleagues have said, but to also tell you, sometimes you do have to go slow to go fast, as Dr. Shepard often reminds us. So finding that balance, I'm glad that's you doing that. I know that you will get that um, done. But my question is around um, the steering committee's areas of focus, yeah. which um, I believe the last area was ensuring equitable access to signature schools. Did I get that right? Yes, ma'am. And what I, um, so my question or comment is about how you arrived at that. And I will tell you why I'm asking that question. Um, when I was a parent leader, many times I had parents of students who were not at signature schools, who, whose students could have gone, they, they qualified. Mm -hmm. um, and what they would often say to me was that what they wanted was for their students to get what the signature school students got, even though they made the choice not to go there. Mm -hmm. So it's almost the inverse of the um, ensuring equitable access. So I just wanted to pose that back to you to say, did you consider that? Were there parents, um, aside from Lisa, who's a great representative, but did we feel we had good input on um, that as far as making that one of the focuses? Yes, yeah, so uh, what we looked at is we really looked at our practices and, and looking at it from an access standpoint. And I do want to state that the process that we've uh, seen over the last few years is more equitable than may, what it may have been maybe eight, nine years ago. And um, you know, my, my uh, uh, daughters went to Border Star, I know yours did, and so did uh, Miss Mansers. And so, you know, at once upon a time, we had, we had practices that were, you know, uh, first come, first serve. We had, uh, you know, a lot of, we had various systems and some of them were less equitable than others because I needed to, not I personally, but a parent needed to have the ability to take off work, to go stand in line. Everyone could not do that, so that it was less equitable. And so we just wanna make sure that if we are inviting students to come walk through and tour schools, you know, who are we inviting? You know, I know we're inviting 
you know, Academy Lafayette and certain other schools, are we inviting troops? Are we inviting Banneker? Does every student have the same equal opportunity access to engage and learn about our signature schools? And that's what we really want to unpack and just investigate uh, because if the uh, core goal of magnet schools once upon a time was to desegregate neighborhood schools and to, and to uh, integrate, almost force integration, uh, if that is not still a target that we should have diversity within our signature programs that are outside of neighborhoods, then we're unlikely to arrive at that end if it's not a goal. So we just wanted to kind of look at it. And, and I do uh, hear what you're saying that if it is truly where families are just not opting for signature schools, then that, you know, if that's what our conclusion is per uh, examining our practices, then we'll be able to come back and say, everyone has equitable access, uh, just not, you know, all families, you know, are not uh, going there, but we truly want to make sure it's, it's not access. Because we do have some, some access uh, barriers within the system. And uh, not to make it a long answer, but if I could just share, you know, I was at a DAC meeting and, you know, a parent stood up to say, I called down to the BOE, no one's called me back. You know, I had a complaint about a school. And so the parent was told, well, you have to go online and download the form, complete it, and then drive it over to the Board of Education and drop it off. And in 2020, you know, one, uh, I have to have, you know, I had to have, first I have to know that a form is even online. Right. I have to have internet access in order to, to, uh, to access it and fill it out. And it was not an option to email it in or scan it in, had to physically drop it off. You know, do I have transportation to get to the BOE? And do I have time to take off work in order to get it over there? So that's, that's inequity. And, you know, can we think through in every department how we may unintentionally put up barriers to some groups being able to access? And I think our signature programs may be one of those, but we could conclude that it's, it's not... It's not, that's not the case. Well, and, and I'll finish really quick, but I want to make sure that if parents are choosing neighborhood schools, they also have access to all the same programs, offerings that the other schools that, whether, you know, if we determine that access is equally available to everybody, mm -hmm. if they're not able to access the same sorts of offerings, um, at the neighborhood level, is that truly giving them equitable access to an opportunity? So, so that would be my reverse of the question. And it's, we don't have to answer it now. I just wanted to make sure that that was being contemplated. Yes, great point. Uh, and, and I think we are expanding, you know, many of the advanced course offerings within neighborhood schools, uh, expanding more of the arts opportunities within neighborhood schools and expanding more of the uh, career uh, courses and strands within the uh, neighborhood schools so that a signature option is not your only way to uh, access uh, those courses. So a uh, great point and we will continue to flush that out through the process. Ms. Cortez. Dr. Davis and um, everybody who's preceded me, thank you for your presentation and for the dialogue. Um, mine are really follow-up questions. They weren't intended that way, but they are follow-up questions to a few of the questions that my colleagues posed. Um, the first is, um, can you share a little bit, well, two questions around your example of the, the school level data on discipline. Mm -hmm. um, how close to real time are school leaders given access to that data so that they can be responsive, you know, kind of what's the, at, as, as this comes together, what do you envision as the timing of that feedback loop um, so that they can act within the school year instead of the following year? And then kind of the follow on to that is, can you share a little bit with us, kind of data is great, but sometimes data also requires coaching to really create change and kind of what's what's happening in parallel with the distribution of that type of data to help, do you anticipate will happen to help school leaders and to advance um, equitable principles and equity within their schools? 
Thank you, and uh, uh, great questions. And uh, to the first, around the data itself, uh, around <clears throat> if principals have access to this data, they have access to uh, pull their own data. And uh, if they don't pull their data, they, they can, uh, with the support of IT or assessment, can have uh, data pulled. Uh, and so the principals do have access to data. Uh, I think this level of data will help them understand their data in a different way because we're gonna break it down by uh, race, gender, uh, other specialized programs or categories that students fall within. And so we can make an, uh, an, an even better informed decision. So this, the way this data will be broken down will be a little bit different than what principals have maybe traditionally looked at in the past. Uh, to your second point, and maybe before I get to the second point around, uh, around coaching, if I could expound a little bit is that when you're just looking at your own school data, oftentimes you, you can't see the full, the bigger picture to know how your data plays into the whole or how, you know, uh, how much is too much, you know, or so forth. You oftentimes can't see the disparity, especially if you're in a school that is 80% you know, one group or what have you, you may not be able to see it. And so uh, the national data, I believe this was from 2013-14, that the uh, U.S. Department of Education released, you know, where they show that in, throughout coast to coast in America, that one out of 20 white students were suspended compared to one out of five black students. And so when, when we pulled our own data and saw that even within an organization, that is trying to be equitable, our data mirrored that national data of one out of five. And so when we look at it from that lens and then break it down for principals to see, here's how your school is contributing to these outcomes that we need to uh, reduce, it will help. So to the second point on the coaching, there is a process that's set up uh, called a data consult that principals uh, go through uh, with their uh, supervisors uh, each year, where they look at data across a you know, variety of spectrums <clears throat> and to hear from principals as to, you know, what are their plans to uh, reduce certain uh, disparities or improve in certain areas per their own school's data. Uh, for this year, because of the new initiative around the, uh, the equity audit, you know, I would uh, likely uh, support that process and, and uh, be a part of that process specifically around the data that comes from the equity audit and to support uh, data analysis and a response to that along with uh, the uh, principal supervisors through that. So I believe coaching is, uh, will be a part of this as well. And let me follow on with my second question, which, so I think you, you talked you, in your presentation about the evolution of, of board policy and administrative policy um, to be responsive to um, the equity work as well. Are we talking about operating in parallel or are we talk, talking about being responsive to your steering committee once you hit a certain point in the process? I, I think I just want to make clear kind of where our, we so, don't want to get out ahead. We don't want to be behind. I think we're looking for that, that place where we're in, 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 uh, harmony with yeah, the work. Yeah, great question. I, I really think that board policy needs to be out in front yep. because we're not addressing all of the disparities through this equity plan. We're only addressing, you know, four priority areas. And so if policy says, you know, or doesn't say that this is a value or this is a priority, it is, you know, difficult to align all of the work to something that's not present. If um, so, and I'm glad you brought up administrative policy because uh, we've got some work to do with administrative policy as well. You know, uh, as we look at our dress code policy, for example, it still has an outdated policy on grooming. And we all saw the national news this past um, spring where a young man with locks in the state of Texas was told he couldn't walk at his graduation because he had locks. You know, and we're, we're thinking like, who would enforce that? But if the policy is, still exists, then whoever's uh, enforcing that policy, it's there on the books. Policy needs to change. Our own policy within Kansas City Public Schools says that a student's hair needs to be neat and 
non-distracting who who determines that who's the gatekeeper you know it's very subjective and so we need to rewrite administrative policies as well to make sure that no student can be marginalized or disenfranchised from that but we also believe that there's opportunities for board policy to uh, set the uh, standard and expectation by which we could uh, align our other policies and practices to board policy. And I agree with that response, Dr. Davis. And, and the, the deal is we don't, we, we can't do it all. I mean, we, 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 when we had our last retreat and Ravel Brown was here, you know, this is, it takes years. So if, if, but if we are able to say we're going to attack two policies, right? We, we've gotten started with the work. You're not going to be able to just do all of this in a short period of time. Um, and he even said, even with them looking at all of their policies, they've had to go back to some and redo them again based on what data is dictating and how times have changed. So um, the policy piece is probably the most critical part of this work because it guides everything that we do in this system. So I really do, I, I think it, it has to lead out in front. So I do agree with that response, Daryl. Um, Mr. Wasserstrom, I wanted to see if you had any questions you wanted to ask. Well, I want to thank Dr. Davis for his uh, continued efforts on such intractable questions like the ones that he's gone over with us today. I did want to point out some specific concern I have about the focus on recruiting uh, specifically minority teachers. It strikes me that a stated policy that we have as a district, a goal of focusing on only hiring minority teachers as opposed to hiring the best teachers of any kind that are available is a flawed and unfortunate um, direction to go in. And uh -huh. I think that the use of statistics that you've used in your talk is unfortunate because if the school district is down to the point where we have 10% white students, the answer is not to single out uh, white teachers and say we need fewer white teachers. The answer is that we need to offer education to the entire community. We need the Kansas City community to look to Kansas City Public Schools as the primary driver of education for children in the Kansas City community. And that means reaching out and involving more white families in Kansas City public schools. I think it's possible. And I think that that's why I've been pushing my uh, feeble effort, which doesn't have much traction apparently, of establishing a white, you know, a um, south of Brush Creek having a middle school so that the community in the Southwest Corridor feels that they have more community-based options for their education. But I'm- Mr. Mr. Uh, Wasserstrom, if, if, thank you first for your comments, but if I could correct uh, something that was just stated, I did not say that we would recruit only teachers of color we wanted to put forth an effort to, uh, to further recruit and retain teachers of color, not to stop the recruitment of all teachers. We currently recruit you know, from many local universities and colleges, and, uh, and we're not gonna stop that recruitment for the same uh, high level quality of teachers we have uh, hoped to uh, attract and attain. Uh, what I was citing is that the research says that all students, not just black and brown students, but all students can and will benefit from having uh, teachers of color. And so, you know, I didn't want to air necessarily our, our, our stats and our data, but we have schools, I'll go ahead and name it. I mean, <laughs> uh, Lincoln Middle, as far as I'm aware, last year had one black teacher. Uh, Hale Cook, you know, <laughs> maybe one black teacher. 
it doesn't matter what the demographics are within the school, all students within that school can benefit from seeing teachers and staff of color. Because when we talk about growing up in a world where we have biases, the biases exist because of limited interaction with each other. And so if I go from grades K through seven and I have not seen a teacher of color, how can I envision myself to be one, to, to be one, to see one? And so uh, we, 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 we've got to be able to address that you know, within our own school system. And if it's not, in, and, and also I didn't state that we need a policy that directs the district to hire uh, minority teachers. What I said is that we just need a statement that says we value diversity because if there's a statement of valuing diversity in, in policy, well then I as an employee of a school or a department because this organization values diversity, well, I should diversify the people that I employ within my department and, and within um, my school. You know, so if, if the cabinet is diverse, if every department is diverse, if every school is diverse, then I think we would have met that end. And, and, and I'm sorry if, if I made a statement that made it seem like we would only recruit uh, from one group. That's, that's not what we're asking for. Well, Dr. Davis, I do want to thank you uh, last week, the school district contacted my younger son, David, and approached him about teaching at a school in the KCPS system on 27th Street. And although he was very excited, since that was the first positive offer he had gotten, right after that, he got a call from Galveston. And when they said they were going to pay him $54,000. He took my car. That's why I took the bus down to the Board of Education this afternoon. I don't have a car. My son took it. And uh, he's down in Galveston. And tomorrow is his first day of teaching in the Galveston public school system. But they, they pay very well in Texas. And their legislate, legislators um, make sure that education is something that's at the very top of the totem pole in the state of Texas. We should do the same here. We have Thank legislators. Madam, Madam Chair, I'm sorry. Can I, can I just sorry, for one, one, one second, please. So okay. I, uh, Mr. Barca has been trying to say something. And then Mr. Hogan. I'll have you say something, and then I'm going to take the point of privilege of asking some questions, too. So, Mr. Barca, then Mr. Hogan. Uh, I would ask Dr. Davis um, and our chair, can we as board members also receive this bias training? Because it is very clear that there are some issues that we need to work on, as well as board members. So, I would very much like to suggest that we do that as well. And we are actually talking, Dr. Davis is... Yep going to be looking for a date, um, some date options to propose to us. It's been something he is eager to do. Yes. Yes. Mr. Hogan? <laughs> yeah. I, I, you know, so, sometimes these conversations are funny. Um, and by funny, I mean not funny at all. Um, and, and I think as a board, we have to sort of check ourselves. And so, you know, because I'm a little bit crazy, I took two summer courses this summer. Um, and one of them was a race and ethnicity class. And I did a research, pro I'm using the word research very loosely, by the way, but I did a research project that was all around representation and why it matters to students of color and white students. And it's exactly what Dr. Davis said way more eloquently than I will probably be able to say. But the reality is, is that they do matter, Mr. Wasserstrom. Um, and I'm happy to send you various um, research papers that actually support that. Um, that are they're very well done and I think the the other thing that that is interesting um, and the reason why your point around bringing more white students into the district isn't getting any traction is because it's not like white kids are a panacea right they are not we're not going to introduce them into schools and suddenly the school, schools just magically get better that's not a thing it's not backed up by research and there's no reason we should pursue that as a number one objective to actually improve the district. So I, I would encourage you to actually start getting steeped in education and the research around it so that you can be more informed when you come to these conversations in the future. Thank you. I'm, I'm going to go ahead and um, ask some 
uh, questions and, and have some comments too. I, first of all, I really appreciate this dialogue. Um, frankly, I wish we had six hours to talk about it because I think we could do six hours actually on this topic. Uh, there's a lot of passion uh, on this board for this very topic. So first I wanna just make a quick comment. Um, I think this board is, Dr. Bedell knows this well, is very committed to the topic of equity. We have been waiting eagerly for this conversation and we've, you know, the community may not recognize that because they're not behind the scenes in our conversations, but we have been calling for this conversation for a while. And so I think it's important for the community to hear that. Um, one of the things that um, I do appreciate about the board policy 0.0, it's 0, .0 for a reason. And I think this is for the community. It kind of sets the stage, it's at the top of the policy. So it, it sets the values and expectations by which all other things flow. So even though I recognize that there's areas in which we need to seriously address both board policy and administrative policy, in fact, you know, the line on board policy 0.0, .0 that says educational equity is the intentional allocation of resources, instruction, opportunities according to need. It, and we go on, it's the commitment of the KCPS board, as my colleague, Mr. Hogan um, noted, to foster a barrier free environment where all students have equitable access to an excellent education within our schools. That is there. So, we have already committed to that. Understanding though, there's some system changes that have to happen, but we as a collective have already committed to that component of barrier free. Um, I think the other thing I wanna say just for community, um, because this has been a really great both discussion and presentation. There is a lot of other work that's happened in order, as you've said, Dr. Davis, to um, really begin to advance equity. So for one, one example is we uh, implemented and the board supported the implementation of an equity-based budget process. So the community may not recognize that there's an equity-based budget process that every school goes through and that there are uh, tiered levels of resources for schools based on need. We have um, significantly increased access to advanced coursework in our high schools. We recognize that as a shortcoming. Um, the um, board has actively supported access to tools and content and training to make it possible for more students to have opportunities. We still have work to go, but I think that um, there has definitely, I'm proud of the board's work and taking action to allocate the kind of resources year after year after year, even growing your team and making that possible. So uh, a couple of quick questions that I have. Um, one, really, I think one is a request for data coming forward to the board. The suspension data gives us a brief snapshot, but did you say when your discussion, when we might be able to receive that kind of chart um, by grade, by zone, and by signature versus neighborhood? Are you at a place where we can you can provide us that suspension data in a future report or in a Friday update according to suspensions by grade level by zone, north, central, and south, and then by neighborhood versus signature. So that would be a request for data. Um, I, you know, I think the, you know, one of the things that is a puzzle for me still, and I don't have to have an answer today, is I'm feeling like some of my colleagues, I think, just chomping at the bit to address some of this suspension data. I'm really feeling some urgency and discomfort in seeing this suspension data. And um, I respect Dr. Bedell's comment that it, it takes some dialogue, but I'm feeling a lot of um, this disappointment still, even though we've made gains and I know that we have. 
So I think that some of the questions I have probably shouldn't be answered today, but I'm wondering about, in fact, the, the district has doubled the number of social workers we have in our district, maybe even more than doubled. We've increased training and readiness for our counselors. We have really invested significantly in um, the division that Dr. Woodley supports. So we have a lot of social emotional resources, probably not all that we need for sure, but we've definitely grown that. So is the change in suspensions, are those investments and those additional resources, are they yielding the level of change that we would expect those to yield? because I, I know that so much of our focus is on teachers and we need to do that because they're the first point of contact with the child, but there are multiple adults in every building, including a counselor, including school nurses, including instructional coaches in most of our schools and principals. So I'm just, I, I don't really know that I can get an answer to it today, but I'm wondering, are those additional resources yielding a commensurate level of change? So I'll so, halt there. So uh, Ms. Manser, I think that's a great question uh, around those investments. And, you know, as I listened to you, I thought about the fact that in 2015, there was a study that showed that unarmed black people were shot and killed at five times the rate five to one of unarmed white people. And if we look at that data, and if we say, you know, is the investment in uh, body cameras, you know, going to yield, you know, these different results, you know, they may, uh, but maybe at the root of that is, you know, why do individuals respond differently, you know, to some groups? And the answer comes back to bias. So though we are making uh, investments in resources, we must also address the individual biases that we show up with, you know, within our educational institution. And so I really like Mr. Barker's, uh, you know, request is that we all, everyone in this organization should really go through the bias training because uh, we're, we're oftentimes unaware how we're responding to different groups. And so I really think uh, per the data, you know, that's a huge disparity that, you know, 88.5% of all suspensions applied to girls went to one group, but there's ample research around that that has been studied, numerous studies across, you know, the, the country, uh, and there's a documentary push out, but there's, there's recorded cases on this, and it comes back to bias, just as there are health care disparities and, you know, who dies on the operating table, you know, trying to give birth. I mean, their, their bias is in our society in this 400 year experiment that we call the United States. And I, you know, I think we have to have that discussion and then we could, we'll better understand why our data looks the way it is. It's a small piece of the macro data that we see in all of society. And we have to address that. You know, so in, in leading onboarding training for teachers you know, many of them, you know, fresh out of college and they're hearing for the first time, you know, this, this systemic inequity, they just have never heard of this, you know? And so for a young 20 year old who, you know, didn't live in the day and time, you know, but uh, I mean, this is a reality. And if I could just share, you know, when I was growing up, you know, I used to go to uh, Fairyland Park, which was an amusement park around 75th and Prospect. And you know, one on one visit there, my father tells me, he says, when I was a kid, we could only come here one day per year. And so I'm thinking you know, maybe they didn't have the finances that it was through economics that they couldn't come you know, more often than what I attended as a kid. He said, no, because African-Americans could only visit that park once per year. And so, you know, at an early age, like, you know, for skin color, limited access to a theme park. And then to further know that the uh, black movie theater at 18th and Vine, but there is a white movie theater in what is current day, you know, the uh, Linwood Shopping Center. So even though these two movie theaters are about what 12 blocks apart, there was segregation, you know, where one group couldn't pass, couldn't go south to 27th Street. And if teachers come into the onboarding 
have no understanding of systemic inequities that existed well before any of us worked for Kansas City Public Schools and how some of those same inequities uh, or what we're still trying to overcome today is kind of baked into the cake, then it's, it's more, I mean, resources will help, but there's a lot we have to tackle through this and, and from multiple methods in order to get to root causes, in order to get to those high outcomes. And so uh, through that equity planning process, it's not gonna be a silver bullet. Once we uncover the root causes, there may be four to five strategies that we have to employ simultaneously in order to get to that ideal outcome. In addition to resources, training, and, and this whole conversation that we're having uh, tonight uh, throughout, as board policy 0, 0.0 says, throughout every level of the school system. Thank you. Um, other questions that people may want to ask, and I know we'll we um, we'll have a, a couple of additional items Dr. Bedell will talk about before we adjourn tonight. But other questions, comments. I mean, I I do have I some closing you, remarks, though. I know I do have some. Okay. Well, yeah, then I, ready. Go ahead. I you think we're ready. Something. No, I think you, I, I just wanted to say, I think, you know, that we're all eager to talk about this <laughs> and at length and, and we have so many things we want to do and we're, we're ready for that. So we, we, I, I'm, I'm trying to see how I want to say this. Superintendents are losing their jobs trying to do this work because there are communities and board members that don't believe that there are inequities, that don't believe that school systems are built on a structural racial, racial a structural racially built system. That's what we got here in Kansas City. I don't care how people, people, you know, people said to me the other day when I put that tip letter out, Oh, he's using race, it's just the buzzword now. No, November 2nd, 2016, at the Waddle Library, the first thing I said to a group of folks, 200 people, before we even start talking about opening up a school, let's address the marginalization, the oppression, and the racism that I've observed only being here for three months. I've been talking about this for four years, folks. This is not new. This is not a buzzword for me. And I talk about the structural racist system that by design has continued to keep these kids and people in this community on their knees crippled. We lace the pockets of wealthy white men in most cases through these tip abatements. And I don't, I'm not, I don't, I'm not, a, I'm not against it because see, if people want to start calling me out saying that I'm out here calling people racist and things of that nature, we can go to the practices. We can go to the practices that have been in the books for this school district for decades. We didn't tell white families to leave when integration was being enforced. We, all we wanted was to have equal access and equal opportunity to be educated like everybody else. All of these textbooks that are written on Kansas City and how race has played out, Mark Bedell's not making that up. I'm not coming here trying to start trouble. What I'm trying to do is just say to people that we have gotten the results that we've gotten through a very intentionally designed system. So when Dr. Davis makes comments about the hair, who decides what hair looks good and what hair looks bad? That's the subjectivity that's been built, right? And in most cases, those policies have been written to stifle our creativity as colored people. Let's just call it what it is. And so when we, when we make the comment about, we wanna be more intentional to try to hire people of color, whether that's Asians, Latino, whether it's black educators, that's, that's research-based because they offer a different type of lived experience. My experience that I offer, there aren't many white people that can talk about my lived experience and how 
I can impart that on students that have to travel and navigate through those same pathways that I've gone through because they haven't lived through that type of extreme poverty, that type of abuse, neglect, having teachers basically tell you you're not going to succeed or turn into anything. So we're not saying that we don't, we want to, we want a diverse staff. I want, I want a diverse staff that reflects this city that reflects the school system that we serve. And I want people to have their hearts in the right place. That's what I want. And so do we have a lot of work to do? Yeah, we really do. We have to dismantle this system, y'all. We have to dismantle this system that by design does not work for the vast majority of kids that you all are charged with governing over and that I'm charged with leading. This isn't about perpetuating past practices of creating a more segregated system. I didn't know those numbers were trending like they were trending at Lincoln. I had no idea until it was brought to my attention. And then I started looking, I'm like, wow, wow. You know, just unconscious. This, this is happening under my watch. What's going on here? I didn't even know that. So you need data like this to bring to the forefront things that we do as leaders to perpetuate a divided city. This school system can no longer be a part of that. We just can't. So as we begin to delve into the policies, I do agree that we have to do some serious training of our own selves. We all have to recognize the level of biases that we all show up with, because every single one of us have them. And how do we, and it's okay to have them, you just can't let it play out on how we're going to service children. You need to figure out and get the training to check it at the door. Because if you don't check it at the door, this will never get any better. We'll just continue to have these meetings and we'll continue to go in this circle. But I do believe that we have a phenomenal opportunity right now to dismantle, to deconstruct, and to build a system that I would say everybody will be proud of. And if it means that our white counterparts, some of them are becoming pioneers and they're saying, I'm gonna send my kid to a neighborhood school. You know, as we begin to get more people, because when we build the quality of our neighborhood schools, just as we're doing with our signature schools, it shouldn't even be a matter of us opening up another school when we already got schools that are already open. But we got to have people saying, I'm willing to come in and I'm willing to do my part. And we got signature schools that are under enrolled too. They're not all, and they're not all fully enrolled. But I'm just trying to keep it as honest as I can be right now, because I'm not, you know, I, I, I know I'm not going to lose my job with this board having this conversation. But this data tells us a lot about what we need to be doing. And there are some big decisions that we have to make. And to your point, Mr. Hogan, maybe we, we, we're not able to start off K through 12. Maybe we are able to start off with a couple of grade levels and gradually do what we need to do to begin to transform this district. I think it's worthy of us having those conversations. And let's figure out what's the best path to begin to transform this school district because we have a great opportunity here. And I really do believe that we cannot let this opportunity pass us by. Can we meet in the middle and call it K through six? <laughs> we, 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 yeah, our teams, we will all talk through it. <laughs> Thank you, Dr. Bedell. Thank you for those words. I, I mean, I hope that you and your team feel that this board is here with you ready to work. We are wholly with you and ready to work. So thank you, Dr. Davis, for that presentation. Um, it is important and it is um, sets the stage for our school year. It is hopefully driving every decision we make as we go forward in, an, in a year of lots of uncertainty and, and new challenges and new hurdles. So I really do appreciate that. Um, Dr. Bedell, we have some other business items. 
We do. Um, there's a couple more items. We want to bring Dr. Collier up, who's going to, um, let me make sure, let me get to my agenda. I just got thrown off here. All right. So Dr. Collier is going to come in. No, we're not there yet. We have some business items, Madam Chair, and then we'll get to Dr. Collier's item. So the first item that we're asking the board to take action on is the uh, School Smart KC, the Excellence in Education Awards in the amount of $159,174. And those are the awards that we provided for our faculty and staff at our awards at our retirement ceremony last year. We weren't able to do that this year, but that, that those funds are available for us um, to do it this, this upcoming school year. Are there any questions about this item? This is an acceptance of um, those grant of those resources. Ms. Wolfsey? Uh, Dr. Bedell, can you just uh, share with us the, um, how this fits with uh, Teacher of the Year and Principal of the Year? Because I know they're complements to one another. Right. Dr. Kyle, you want to break, break it down? Oh, I'm sorry. I have to unmute. <laughs> um, so um, our, the, the teacher of the year, and I, and I may have to lean on uh, communications and academic division just to be sure. Um, the teacher of the year and principal of the year is more of a um, where those employees are being voted on mm -hmm. by their peers for selection. Whereas the Excellence in Education Awards, um, there has been criteria set around uh, student growth performance, um, also attendance for the teacher. Um, there, uh, there's a set criteria in order to um, be acknowledged and recognized for those awards. So though, though, that's the primary difference between those two. The Excellence in Education Awards are presented um, by the um, through the HR department with our employee recognition ceremony, and then the the teacher of the year and principal year is a separate ceremony and that is presented by our communications department. Thank you. Are there any other questions on this item? All right. Um, then it would be in order to receive a motion to approve the recommendation of the superintendent to accept the grant from School Smart KC. Uh, in the amount of 159,174, this will be for three years. So moved. So moved. Oh, second. All right. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any debate on this motion? Hearing none, the secretary will please call the roll. Mr. Abarca? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. <laughs> Mr. Hogan? Yes. Ms. Manser? Yes. Mr. Wasserstrom? Yes. Ms. Wolsey? Yes. Thank you. There's a majority in favor, and the School Smart KC grant is accepted. The next item, Dr. Bedell? Yeah, Madam Chair, we're asking the board to take action on the school calendar 2021 school year. You all voted on this recently. We had one small error that doesn't impact our calendar other than that we had 184 teacher work days and it needs to be 185. So just wanting to amend it to make sure that it reflects 185. Are there any questions about this item before we take action? Okay, hearing no questions, um, the, uh, it would be in order to receive a motion to approve the recommendation of the superintendent to approve the revised school calendar for the 2020-2021 fiscal year. <laughs> Second. All right. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any debate on this motion? <clears throat> Hearing none, um, the secretary will call the roll, please. Mr. Abarca? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. Mr. Hogan? Yes. Ms. Manser? Yes. Mr. Wasserstrom? Yes. Ms. Wolfsey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. There's a majority in favor and the school calendar is approved. Um, Dr. Bedell, the last item. Last item is, hallelujah, thank you. We got through it. We had, um, this has been months of work with our team. And I'm just so happy that we have been able to come to some agreements in our language in the collective bargaining agreement. 
for certified personnel, teachers, counselors, librarians. And we want you all to take actions to accept the, um, the amendments to the CBA, but we also wanted to give you all an overview of what's been done during this negotiating session. And this will be on the books for two years, I believe. We, we can years. come in and make some amendments, but it's a three-year CBA agreement. So Dr. Collier, close us out. All right. Um, Joe, are you in control of the PowerPoint or am I? Uh, we, we'll give you control. We'll put it up and give you control. Okay. Thank you. Um, did we go all the way back to the beginning or? I, Joe, I think it went all the way back to the beginning. <laughs> there we are. Okay. <clears throat> so <clears throat> as Dr. Bedell just stated, we just completed our um, negotiation session um, for this year and we made, uh, we've come to an agreement for three years. Uh, beginning this school year, um, continuing through um, June 30th of 2023. <clears throat> we began our negotiations in January of this year and we completed actually last Thursday. We actually had a previously completed. However, some of the language that we agreed to in the spring um, was no longer relevant after we um, took a look at some of what happened over the spring and some of our learnings and getting feedback from our families, our teachers and students. Um, so we had to go back and revise some of that digital learning language. And then we also had a brief pause due to COVID-19, about a month where we were not meeting and we were not uh, negotiating. So uh, overall it was about a six month period um, in order to complete all of our negotiations. I'm not moving here. Joe, do you have control or do I? Uh, you, you should. Sorry, David's controlling it. Um, we'll we'll pop that's it back fine. up. We'll I go ahead and move for you. I can just tell you when. Okay, that's fine. Okay. All right. So, um, these here are the members of the negotiation teams for KCPS administration, as well as um, the AFT. Um, and I, I just want to say that um, I felt like we had a really good composition of team members this year on both sides of the table. I feel like there was a lot of listening, hearing one another, and working to understand the perspectives of one another. And sometimes that can be a challenge um, because um, both groups have their own interests and it, sometimes it's difficult to come to an agreement around what should actually happen. But I was very pleased with the process this year uh, between the two teams. And I feel like we made a lot of um, headway. And, and I, as I stated earlier, we um, typically engage in a very traditional uh, negotiation process. Um, but this time it felt like we were moving more into, into um, interest base where we were hearing one another and working together to come to some resolutions around what will be best for our students and for our staff. And so um, overall, very good process, very good represent representation of departments as well. I wanna commend our principals that were a part of this team. They did an outstanding job representing schools and, um, and, and really communicating what the needs of schools are um, for our teachers. And likewise, the teachers did the same thing for the administration. So just overall, an excellent team. Okay, next slide, please. Um, so here are the items that we addressed um, for this, um, this school year. Um, I put an asterisk by the items that are actually new sections. So these are sections that did not exist prior to this negotiation period. Um, and then also the ones in bold are the key areas. And I'm going to talk a little bit about those key areas in just a moment. Uh, but you can see our new sections were around the work year for Missouri options and middle college teachers. We didn't have any language there, so we were able to add that at this point. We also added, of course, distance learning language because we needed that, especially since we we're beginning the year um, with distance learning language. So we have clearly outlined language around expectations for our staff um, and teaching. Uh, we also added our workday provisions for distance learning, and that includes um, some of the other certified groups besides teachers like counselors and, um, and other staff that needed to have guidelines delineated as well. And then we also added excessive absence language. And this was very important for us because over the years, uh, I can remember even being a principal, my, principal myself and struggling with how do we determine what is excessive absence when we're addressing teachers. 
and it was very subjective. Um, and we do have a policy around it, but it states excessive absence, but it doesn't really clearly define what that is. And so we were able to do that um, in this negotiation period. Okay, next slide. And, um, and on that other slide, I did include the page number. So for the public who maybe wanna go back to reference, you have the page numbers there. So you can see where those changes were made. Okay, next slide. All right, so one of the uh, first areas we updated, one of the key areas was our work year for teachers. Um, as you all know, we have, we are going to have a delayed start of September 8th. However, we had already set our start date for teachers um, August 7th. So um, we had to find at least 10 days where the teachers would not be meeting in order to comply with our um, 185 day teacher contract. And so we um, instituted a two week intercession from August 17th through the 28th. And those are non work days for our teachers. And so this is a little bit different for us because we've already started the year last Friday. But come Monday, they will have a break for two weeks. And actually, in retrospect, I, I think this is really going to be valuable. And we'll see how it comes out. I think that I, after all the PD that they're receiving um, over last week, we had the new teacher boot camp. And then this week, we are, we're ha we've had um, the teacher institute. And so I think with all of the professional development, all the learning they've had, I think that two-week intercession is going to be valuable. Um, for processing and uh, and then thinking about how they're going to apply all of their learnings um, to their practice. Um, uh, the other change was parent-teacher conferences. We traditionally have parent-teacher conferences on Thursday um, in the fall and in the spring. This uh, negotiation season, we added Wednesday as well. And I think this is also going to be valuable. That Wednesday will be a half day for students. And then the remainder of the day will be parent-teacher conference times. And this will allow for our teachers um, to schedule and set up uh, times with our parents. And it, it also adds some level of options for our parents around the day that they want to attend conferences. And there you can see our two Wednesday dates are there, October and February. Um, the other change um, is the election day, which is a non-school, non-work day that November 3rd, that was new to our calendar this year. Um, and then finally, we've added the language for the Missouri options and the middle college teachers. Okay, next slide. Uh, teacher work day. This was a, um, a, a huge area for us. Um, and I think the thing that we, we hear from both teachers and from administrators is we need time. Uh, we, uh, the principals uh, feel that they need time for professional development, which we know is very important. And then also our teachers are saying we need time to plan. So when you look at those first two bullets, what actually happened is it was almost a swap of time. Um, and that is um, last year, our, our principals only had the first, second, and third Wednesdays of the month. Um, after this negotiation season, they will also have the fourth. So they have the first, second, and third, and fourth Wednesdays for that extended day for PLC time. That used to be a flex day. It is no longer. And then in exchange, our, our teachers who are entitled to 250 minutes of plan time a week, they actually we actually negotiate, negotiated a couple years ago and um, we agreed that two of those plan times will belong to the principal. And since that time, we have heard from teachers saying we need that time to plan. So now that plan time has returned to our teachers and they do have that 250 minutes of plan time per week. So that next bullet, we have first, second, third Wednesdays for professional learning communities and professional development is embedded in that. And when you look in the CBA now, there's a very clear definition around what are PLCs. The five components of the process are outlined there. So everyone has a clear understanding of what should happen on those PLC Wednesdays. We also um, embedded a five minutes at the end of each PLC Wednesday for evaluation because we want to hear back from our teachers around the effectiveness of of that PLC time and the professional development. So um, every school will be providing a PL, a, um, an evaluation survey for their staff members. Um, and then also in the language, we agree that if the professional development wasn't applicable, it, it may not fit the content area for a, a particular teacher, um, it will require mutual agreement between the teacher and the principal, but um, that teacher could participate in some alternate professional development. Okay, next slide. Um, then other workday provisions, uh, a, a very critical piece is around training. Um, we know you all have heard many times about safe schools training that rolls out to all of our staff members. Um, this year we had included at least three modules on COVID-19, which is gonna be very important that all of our staff members um, observe as well as all the other training requirements that we, that we include every annually. And so um, we have allowed a half day 
during those pre-service weeks for our staff members to complete the Safe Schools training. We always give them a deadline of October 31st, but it's really ideal if our our staff members can complete the training prior to our students' arrival. So we've embedded time in, the, in these weeks where they, they can actually engage in that training and get it completed. Next slide. Um, then the distance learning plan. We had no language around distance learning because we weren't doing a lot of distance learning, but COVID-19 changed all of that. Um, and so for our distance learning, we created a snow day work workday schedule. So if we know in time um, prior to the end of the school day that the next day will be an inclement weather, weather or snow day, then we have a schedule that's uh, delineated there. So staff members know exactly what needs to be done on those days. Also for our distance learning workday is a seven hour workday for staff. Um, there, there must be four hours of synchronous instruction and that's just live interactive instruction with the teacher. So all they're, although they're on Zoom, they will be able to talk and ask questions just like we're doing tonight. So there will be at least four hours for both our elementary and secondary schools. And you can see how that's broken down into whole group and then also a, a, a certain amount of time must be given to small group and intervention. So we address the various tiers that our students are currently performing at. Um, and then we, there's one hour of un, un, uninterrupted plan time. We've also given them an hour duty free for lunch and then 30 minutes of PLC and 30 minutes of office hours in that distance learning day. Okay, next slide, please. Um, and then the other workday provisions for distance learning also addresses the other groups outside of the classroom teachers. Uh, we have language there for our counselors, librarians, special education teachers, ELL teachers, all of our support teachers, art, music, PE, iSpark. Um, so you can see, I don't have to read it all, but we have language for all of these groups so that everyone clearly understands what should happen for them on these distance learning days. As we are starting the school year, um, all of our employee groups should be aware of exactly what is expected of them um, as we move forward. Next slide, please. And then here's our excessive absence language. So um, we're, we're, we've defined um, excessive, excessive absence as unexcused absences for 10% or more of the total work days at any given point in the school year. And so I have an example there. Um, so for example, um, if we've had 60 work days at 10% of that would be six unexcused absences. absences. At that point, the, the, the um, principal or the supervisor can address that that particular employee, that teacher or whomever around absences, because we know how important it is for our teachers to be present daily working and teaching our students. We want to um, alleviate the need of having subs so frequently. And so we really need for our staff members, unless it's um, uh, some health concern or as is stated their workers compensation or jury duty, professional development, we really need our staff members present. And so we have, um, together created this definition for excessive absences. And so there's a clear understanding for our teachers and our administrators around that. And I just wanna once again, thank all the members of the team, um, both the admin and AFT side, because we really came together and worked hard this year. And overall, it was a very positive process. And so it was one that I felt good about <clears throat> and look forward to engaging in the future. So thank you. Uh, any questions? Thank you, Dr. Collier. It's open for questions. Um, seeing, seeing or hearing no questions from anyone. Thank you. That's um, substantial progress, yes. phenomenal work. And um, I think we all really appreciate the highlights and the way in which you created some definition to areas of work. Uh, Mr. Hogan. Go ahead. Yeah, no, I would, Madam Chair, I would just echo your your thanks. Um, <laughs> Dr. Collier will remember, like, I feel like I asked about this <laughs> every couple of weeks. I'm sure it wasn't that much, but it certainly probably felt like it from your perspective. <laughs> so um, <laughs> such an important item though, right, to, to figure out and, and tricky um, indeed, I'm sure. And so thank you for your persistence. Uh, the entire team that worked on this did a did a phenomenal job. It sounds like, and and thanks to Andrea and the and the AFT team as well for coming together because it takes both parties yep. reaching an agreement, right, and feeling like they're both being well represented throughout this process. So so thanks for getting it done, and now we can we can go focus on educating our kids. That's right. 
Um, and I'll just, I would just say for me, the important part is the relationship piece, um, because the truth is whether we are administrators or teachers, we're all in this work together. So it's so important that we, um, everybody understands their, their value here and everybody feels like they have a voice at the table. And that was one of the things I really appreciated about this process is that um, there was equal voice at the table. And I felt like we really engaged in a very collaborative process to work through some of these, um, these items. It wasn't always easy. We didn't always agree, but it was a very amicable process this time, very respectful. And we had a chance, um, I gained a lot of respect for the, the teachers on the other side of the table and the work that they do and the way they approach many of these topics. And so uh, it was valuable for them to hear from us as well, understanding the administrative perspective, why we feel like we need time, why we need professional development. It was very important for us to have these conversations with one another um, and hear one another and then come to an agreement. So I feel very good about uh, what has just happened here. And I look forward to continuing to work with um, th that staff in the future. Thank you. I think um, the feeling is definitely mutual there because I know Andrea shared with me that she was pretty pleased with the group that we put together. And I know that we were very pleased with the group that she put together. And um, so I really do want to say to the, the teacher representatives and uh, Andrea Flinders, um, a job well done. And uh, this is how negotiations should go. Now it took us a while because of COVID-19, but this is how it should go. Thank you so much. Uh, we all appreciate hearing that. Um, if there are no additional questions, then it would be in order to move the approval of the recommendation of, of the superintendent to approve the revisions to the current collective bargaining agreement for certified personnel, teachers, counselors, and librarians. So moved. Second. It has been moved and seconded. Is there any debate on the motion? Hearing none, this will be a roll call vote. The secretary will call the roll. Mr. Abarca? Yes. Ms. Cortez? Yes. Mr. Hogan? Yes. Ms. Manser? Yes. Mr. Wasserstrom? Yes. Ms. Wolfsey? Yes. Thank you. Thank you. There's a majority in favor and the collective bargaining agreement is approved. Um, Dr. Bedell, I think you want to introduce some business items for us for the next meeting. Madam Chair, we have five that we're asking the board that we will request the board to take action on. Um, the first one is a web-based assessment and data representation platform, Illuminate, Illuminate in the amount of 294500 The second item is alternative mode pupil transportation services, uh, not to exceed um, $2 million. The third one is charter MOUs, but calculations are in process right now around what that amount will be, and you, you all will get that well in advance. And then the, th the fourth one is discovery ed contract in the amount of $342,975, and then the Sherwood uh, contract for $433,890. So those are the five items that we're asking the board to take action on in two weeks. Thank you so much for that. Okay. Um, if there is no further discussion or Dr. Bedell, if you have no further comments for this evening, I'm pausing to see. No, I'm trying to get to some food. Okay. Uh, well, <laughs> nope. then this brings us to the conclusion of our agenda for this evening. So with no objections, this meeting will be adjourned and we will see everyone uh, in the public on August 26th. Thank you so much. Thank you all. Bye, everyone. Bye, Thank guys. you very much. Bye. Goodbye.